मानसी मैं स्टार्ट करूं हां जी सर हो गया सर ठीक है मानसी मैं शुरू कर रहा हूं नमस्कार मैं विभव श्रीवास्तव शिक्षा सहायक राष्ट्रीय प्राणी उद्यान हमारे YouTube चैनल के सभी दर्शकों को राष्ट्रीय विज्ञान दिवस की हार्दिक बधाई देता हूं आज विज्ञान दिवस के उपलक्ष्य में हमने एक विशेषज्ञ वार्ता का आयोजन किया है जिसमें हम आपको वन्य जीव संरक्षण के क्षेत्र में विज्ञान एवं प्रौद्योगिकी के योगदान के बारे में बताएंगे इस वार्ता के लिए हमारे बीच में मौजूद हैं विशेषज्ञ के रूप में मौजूद हैं डॉक्टर उपवन्य हो और साथ ही हमारे साथ जुड़े हुए हैं हमारे राष्ट्रीय प्राणी उद्यान की संयुक्त निदेशक महोदय सुश्री अनामिका क्यूरेटर एजुकेशन श्री रियाज अहमद खान और बायोलॉजिस्ट श्री मनोज कुमार एवीओ डॉक्टर विकास जायसवाल और मानसी जो कि हमारे यहाँ वॉलेंटियर हैं मैं रियाज श्री रियाज अहमद खान जी को आमंत्रित करता हूँ कि वो कृपया हमारे विशेषज्ञ डॉक्टर उपमन्यु हो रही का स्वागत में दो शब्द बोले जी सर आ रही है साउंड इज नॉट कमिंग आवाज आ रही है सर किसी टेक्निकल रीजन की वजह से सर की आवाज हम तक नहीं पहुंच पा रही है नहीं सर ठीक है सर ठीक है सर ठीक है आवाज नहीं आ रही किसी वजह से तो मैं वार्ता शुरू करने से पूर्व डॉक्टर उपमन्यु पहले मैं डॉक्टर उपमन्यु का राष्ट्रीय प्राणी उद्यान की तरफ से हार्दिक स्वागत करता हूं कि वो इतने कम समय के उस पर और आ गए हमारे बीच में और इस वार्ता के लिए उन्होंने हाँ कर दिया डॉक्टर उपमन्यु पिछले करीब सत्रह वर्षों से इन्वायरमेंटल कॉन्जर्वेशन के फील्ड में कार्य कर रहे हैं ये एक कॉन्जर्वेशन बायोलॉजिस्ट और एक एजुकेटर हैं इन्होंने भारतीय वन्य जीव संस्थान यानी वाइल्ड लाइफ इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ इंडिया में रिसर्च फेलो के रूप में रहते हुए काफ़ी कॉन्जर्वेशन से रिलेटेड बहुत से इश्यूज पे इन्होंने पेपर भी पब्लिश किए हैं इन्होंने आ, हमारे विभिन्न जो आदिवासी समुदाय या ट्राइबल कम्युनिटीज होती हैं उनके आ, कल्चरल और उनका जो कल्चरल ट्रेडिशन है ट्रेडिशनल जो भी है Uh, उसका कनेक्शन नेचर के साथ क्या है इसके ऊपर इन्होंने काफी काम किया है वर्तमान में डॉक्टर उपमन्यु एमिटी इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ फॉरेस्ट्री एंड वाइल्ड लाइफ में असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर के रूप में कार्यरत हैं इनको इनके कार्यों के लिए आईपीएससी फाउंडेशन से अवार्ड मिल चुका है और साथ ही ये एक्टिव मेंबर हैं विभिन्न संस्थाओं के जिसमें यू 
UNDS ESA सोसाइटी फॉर कॉन्जर्वेशन बायोलॉजी और अमेरिकन इकोलॉजिकल सोसाइटी इत्यादि प्रमुख है अब मैं डॉक्टर उपमन्यु से स्वागत चाहता हूं कि कृपया वो अपना वार्ता प्रस्तुत करें ऑडिबल टू ऑल ऑफ यू एम आई ऑडिबल जी सर आपकी आवाज आ रही है सो फर्स्ट आई वुड स्टार्ट विद थैंक यू टू ऑल ऑफ यू फॉर गिविंग मी दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी ऑफ नेशनल साइंस डे स्पेशली टू द डायरेक्टर ऑफ एनजीपी जॉइंट डायरेक्टर ऑफ एनजीपी क्यूरेटर ऑफ एनजीपी मिस्टर विभव श्रीवास्तव फॉर इंट्रोड्यूसिंग मी हियर इन दिस प्लेटफॉर्म uh and all the scientific staff of ngp uh i am right now assistant professor in amity as uh, we have said that i am assistant professor in amity institute of uh, forestry and wildlife right uh today's topic what i chose uh, to deliberate or share with you is very close to my heart and uh, since childhood i was very interested to work on this and uh, during my masters as well as my phd i especially work on that though right now i'm working in a very different field together but uh, this is what something i think right now from the from the point of conservation point of view it's very important to address this issue because this is which is critically linked with the human survival even at the post covid world uh, the 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 things which we generally not going to notice now most of the scientists are giving that idea that those things are actually uh, critically important for that and uh, the the person who actually coined this term the little things that run the world he very sadly passed away last year he is one of my favorite person and he is one of the uh, very renowned scientist in the world one of the leading scientist in the world when you talking about the biodiversity and the conservation his name is eo wilson and uh, he quoted like if all mankind were to disappear the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that exists 10000 years ago but if uh, insects were to vanish the environment would collapse into chaos so he actually set up the premise of our understanding that how critically important this small groups are small means in terms of size because when you are talking about the conservation we talking about those uh, big big flagship species like right from tiger to elephant to polar bear to giant panda right to jaguar but when it comes to ecosystem functioning when it comes to the survivability of the forest when it comes to you know the linkage of flow of materials and energy so this group is equally important and sometimes it's more important uh than the other groups as i feel even when i was working in wildlife institute of india while i was doing my phd many of the people are working on the big mammals but i worked on a very different groups which is also the size is small so i worked on spiders during masters i worked on butterflies so i while working on this i had that experience that how they are connected with most of the functioning real functioning of the ecosystem and based on that we find most of our survival is crucially dependent on that so that is the reason i, I you know the idea of giving lectures on this group particular group insecta because they perform numerous amount of ecosystem services right from scavenging predators detrivores herbivores prey for the vertebrates on or the invertebrates they are the pollinators they are the seed uh, dispersal they also used for the plant protection so this is a whole world of plant animal interaction when you're talking about this is this is the group is very close with the plants uh, when it comes to the what benefits they they are giving us there are in number of ways they are they are linked with our benefits right right from the biological control there are many insects which are uh, feeding on other insects in order to control them right there and when it comes to the pollination i will come to the pollination in detail in later but when it comes to also the pollination we find that my slides are changing right 
Monsi? Yes, sir. Please. King, right? Okay. So when it comes to the pollination, even the we now from last five years, mm -hmm. people are talking about you know more talking about the pollination thing because uh, is a, in a human history we are going to face that full scarcity uh, if we set apart the GM thing, GM crops, uh, it, which is not a permanent kind of solution for the human, you know, meet up the starvation and hunger. But when you're talking about the normal uh, crops or, or the normal plants, we know how important these honeybees are, right? Uh, we know how important these bombix smoothie, the seed productions are for us. We know how important they serve as a food. There are many of my students working in different parts of India on entomophagy, where people or the local culture or indigenous culture actually feeds on these uh, insect group. And one of the reasons for feeding them is that is an alternative source of protein for them. So they are not getting access to, you know, good, right kind of protein. So this actually supplement their, you know, protein requirement as such. Not only in India, in Southeast Asia, it was very prevalent, one of the practice. In Africa, it was a very prevalent practice over there. Plus, we know that how bees, butterflies, and other insects, how aesthetically, you know, pleasing us, how they connect us with the nature, right? So, there are utilitarian values, and there are values which is non-utilitarian, but those are also demanding because Right now, we know how human psychology is linked with the nature. And even E.O. Wilson said the term biophilia, that means how our genetic makeup is very much, you know, linked with the nature itself. So when you get into the nature, we feel relaxed. One of the reasons is that millions of years of DNA is, you know, present in our body and which governs our mind. And we feel calm, quite peaceful with this nature. Uh, insect as a group is extremely diverse, extremely diverse. And uh, when JBS Holden has been asked that what what is God's, you know, uh, the greatest creation, uh, JBS Holden said it's the beetle. So he said the God has that inordinate fondness for the beetle. So you can understand even a beetle group have so much diverse. So in in all the species we get to see, right? 64% of the species is uh, insect and all the described species 56% is insect. So when you are talking about the terrestrial ecosystem, conservation of the terrestrial ecosystem or even right now people are talking about the aquatic ecosystem. So we start understanding how important, you know, keep that set. It's a 50% of the set of the whole genome existing over there. So if we cannot afford to lose this 50% of the genetic diversity. So it's very important to preserve this part of the biodiversity, even though they may, you know, visibly look not so appealing to us, or maybe they are not visibly very, you know, from, from a human point of view, visibly not very appealing. But when it comes to the working state, what when it comes to the functional states, this is a one of the very very important group. Uh, if we, even if we when you look at the total biomass, if you look uh, in this in this particular picture, if you look at the biomass, this uh, all has been created. The size has been created based on the biomass. So if you look at the insect, uh, this group is. If you look at compared to body size in compared to the other groups, you find the huge amount of biomass and the holding by this insect group itself. That means right from the Arctic to the Antarctic, right from the tropical forest to the temperate forest, to the grassland, to the mm -hmm. marine area, everywhere you'll find the presence of these groups. They are so diverse that till now, I, this is a rough estimate of that, that more than 350 species of the coleoptera of the beetles have been found. Flies, which is more than 125,000 species has been described. When it comes to the butterflies and moths, more than 160,000 species have been identified. When it comes to ants, bees, wasps, hymenoptera, it's more than one lakh described species worldwide we find. And it's so much important for us, especially when we look at the human food, right? So 
this is the food for thought. So your left side, you can see that when these groups exist, we get to see the colorful varieties of vegetables, fruits, everything is coming from this group. So tomorrow, if we lose them, we probably end up in the right hand part of the picture. Our shelves will be this, all the supermarket will be there, but the shelves will not have anything, any colorful thing as such. So our world will be very, very black and white and full of hunger and starvation if this group is, is in, in a, a very bad condition. So as I said that this group is our food source. So if we say, for example, these uh, elephants, beavers, right, uh, bats, squirrels, if they are called the ecosystem engineers, to me, this group, these wasps, bees, butterflies, they are the investment banker, right? They, because of that, we are into a millions of dollars of business, right? So if you look at the crops that require the insect pollination, the IPBS very recently in 2019, they come out with an estimation of 235 to 577 billions of economic assets has been produced by this group right it's only the pollination i am not talking about the other ecosystem services there are around 28 ecosystem services uh, which has been identified by this group then the, how they are you know for regulating provisioning all this which has been described in uh, millennium ecosystem goal if you look at the food crops 87 percent of the major food crops depended on insect pollination 35% of the world global food product production is dependent on that. If you look at the pollinator mediated crops, which is estimated in 2011, uh, which is a 40% of global nutrient supply is free from this group, right? But right now we are getting a warning signal. 2017, there is a fast study, which is in a global study, standard study being done in Germany, which is giving a very, very warning signals. And it really opened many of the conservationist eye that it's not that right now we start, you know, we, we will be in that ignorance mode. That this is a time that we need to look at the things very seriously. So this studies, this study, particular study has been done for last 27 years, which we called as a long-term ecological study because it, to understand ecology you need long-term data so based on that long-term data they find there is a 75 percent decline of the insect diversity or uh, also the insect biomass in germany right similar things come three years later by another holman study in 2020 the same kind of trend this also starts finding in netherlands so it was so al alarming that guardian colonist uh, George Monbiot coined the term insect garden to warn the impacts of global insect collapse are more catastrophic than our climate change problem. So maybe before the climate we supposed to have that all the impacts of the climate change, we may lose a huge proportion of the, this insect diversity, which the ecologist wants that insects are indeed disappearing before we even have the data because data is a big problem for us. When it comes to the India, the, the growing concern, the growing voices is almost same. So uh, this is a famous one of the uh, ecologists and he works on the animal behavior, Raghavendra Gadakka, was the chairman of Center for Contemporary Studies in ISC. He said, I have been following the literature on the decline of the insects and I suspect that there is little or no information from India. So this is very saddening fact that in India, we don't know what is going with us. Like We don't know how that is going to change our agriculture landscape. We don't know how it's going to change our forest landscape. We don't know how it's going to change the entire, you know, human nature interaction in future. There are many uh, dragonfly species which used to be fine before. They are giving a warning signal like dragonfly expert Dr. Subramaniam said that many of the dragonflies which used to be found earlier, it's th those things are not found right now. Because one of the reasons our the wetlands are declining at an alarming rate, 
all over the India. We don't have a Wetland Act till now. We have Wildlife Act, but we don't have Wetland Act. And since they are disappearing, these dragon populations are in very much at risk. Similarly, as WWF Planet Index said that the most critical ecosystem right now is aquatic ecosystem. Similarly, we find same kind of things in case of the aquatic insects, mayflies, stoneflies, caddis flies. They are also disappearing at an alarming rate. When it comes to bee, which is, you know, we understand bees and, and as Albert Einstein once said that if we lose the bees in after four days, the whole humanity may collapse, right? So if we look at India, we find that 40% of the honeybees disappeared from India in last 25 years. And 40% is only we are talking about wild honeybees. We are not talking about carpenter bees or bumblebees or leaf cutter bees. Two months before I get a paper on bumblebees, in 2021, before that, there is no ecological studies being done on bumblebees. We don't know where that distribution is. We don't know that which are the areas they are, you know, from their range, extinction is happening. We don't know what is their population status is. We don't know how they are interacting with the environment. So it's it's very, very alarming in, in that way. And when Panure uh, in 2016 studied, he said that in India, there is a no estimates available about the composition of the bees. Yes, JSI is working on the taxonomic front, but ecological knowledge we don't have. We don't have knowledge of if you don't have a knowledge of ecology, we probably could not take steps on the conservation point of view. And even countries like Sri Lanka had a, have taken a lead over India in carrying out the detailed studies on the non apis bees or other pollinators. We have a very less understanding of these pollinators. Uh, two, three years back, one of my friends who worked with JDSI, they had given a fair idea about how moths are one of the very critical you know, uh, groups in the Himalayan areas when it comes to the pollination of those wild plants. So most of the areas are still gray. We have no idea how it's happening. We don't know that whether tomorrow, if those pollinators are, we are not going to get the pollinators, how we are going to you know, uh, support our agriculture system, how we're going to support our farmers, how we support our economy, which is very much agricultural based economy, how are we going to support the food security system? So many peoples are living in our country. Globally, we have 7 billion and by 2050, it will be like 10 to 12 billion. We don't know how to feed them. So it's, it's right now this time uh, for to understand this whole insect ecology as such, because insect are one of the group which has been uh, like a very ignored group, though most of our work, most of the big scientists in, in, in our science scientific field, right from Darwin to Wallace, they started their work with that. But still we have so many species are there which is undiscovered, unnamed, unknowing. So if you talk about the IUCN red list, IUCN red list only found that 8,400 species of insects, that means out of 1 million known to exist. I have seen 2019 report is that. Uh, 5 to 10 percent of the, all the insect species died out since the industrial area, which is a kind of extinction we started as an anthropocentric extinction. And we get into that in the age of six mass extinction, which is highly induced by our activities altogether. But the, our, our understanding that which are the species we are losing, we have no idea. Every time there is some species we are missing. By the time I, I probably end up my lecture, one species we are going to lose, right? So of an estimated 8 million uh, animals and plant species, around 1 million are threatened with the extinction. And of which 75% are the insect, which is recent IPBS, estimation is that 2019. Let's see what are the drivers of, of this extinction because when you are talking about extinction, when you are talking about the disappearance, we also need to understand that what actually drives them extinction. Those drivers are not very different from you know other wildlife species like habitat loss is one of them because most of the forest, tropical forests 
we are you know, you know losing because of the development process the whole development process right from the linear infrastructure right from mining and everything we are losing them we had a huge amount of uh, insects which are dependent on our agriculture landscape right now their condition is at stake because of our invention of so many chemicals we have introduced the human in the human history more than 20000 different chemicals and those chemicals had been indiscriminately using in various countries some of the economically uh, sound count countries where the laws and rules and regulation are very strict but most of the countries at least 70 75% countries there is no law strict laws or rules or regulation on on the use of the pesticides and these pesticides are creating huge amount of problems for this insect species to be because most of the pesticides are not targeted pesticides these pesticides even they are food generation pesticides those pesticides are not only killing the pest but they are killing the important beneficial all the life forms right from your uh, 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 the insects to the beneficial bacteria and in the soil so most of the cases our soil had been contaminated our food had been contaminated because of that uh, and we find that more than since 1970 more and more land area farming area gets into after green revolution gets into this whole process of uh, uh, mechanized agriculture where where the quantity has been given more importance we find more and more amount of land has been contaminated so it is not contaminating only the insects it's also contaminating us we find huge amount of invasive species problem right the entire spectrum of the species problem is right now we are facing from the invasive species right from lantana camera to parthenium to prosopis juliflora so the our landscape is changing so these invasive species are which is which we have taken from the other countries which is not our native species they are replacing most of the native species and the more and more native tree species we are losing the more and more insect diversity we are losing and again we had a problem of the climate change there are many areas where the entire precipitation change the entire temperature regime change there are many butterflies which we used to find at the higher altitudes they are all coming down some of them got extinct because they cannot have that behavioral plasticity set so that they can adapt with the you know the rate of change of the climate so fast there is a huge amount of over exploitation of this also we find i am i can show you that what kind of over exploitation we do generally in, in in case of the insect trade or the pet trade of the insects and obviously there is a co extinction when we lose a uh, very specific kind of plants trees right where specialized insects are there so they had a very strong connection over there right so once we are going to lose that trees we are also going to lose the insects particular insects not only the adult life of the insects is important but also the larval life of the insects the child life of the insects are also important because many of the trees are very specific in terms of their larval stage or the pupal stage and sometimes they use different kinds of trees for uh, the entire life cycle so those things are very intricately linked so this is one of the paper if you people are interested to read uh, you can read this paper has been published in 2020 in biological conservation by pedro cardoso and the other groups uh, which includes one of the famous insect biologist from uk which is, his name is michael samways so they said the how like what is a warning to the humanity when when it comes to the insect extinction right when it comes to the habitat loss pollution invasive species climate change over exploitation co extinction this change the entire spectrum of the ecology right from changing their abundance biomass their entire timing has been changed right there are many areas in the himalayas the studies being found that they are trying they are finding that the kind of you know initial warning that there is a mismatch between the phenology of the trees and or or phenology of the herbs or the shrubs and also the timing of the poly, uh, pollination because the the time of the winter is changing the time of the summer is also changing so it's also changing the whole flowering thing over there having mismatch 
with these pollinators also create a lot of problems. We are losing a lot of phylogenetic diversity in many of the areas. The functional diversity is decreasing over the years. The network between the different uh, insect species, like there are many insect species which are linked to each other. So those, everything is getting mismatched. And this is, this is what leads to most of the ecosystem services, what we want in terms of our survival. So this is the thing where we are talking about. There is a, also a big market for the smuggling of the insects. Right from the Mexico, South America, Central America. These pictures have been taken from one of the articles from National Geography. And it shows that there are markets available out there where there are private collectors out there who actually buy and sell those insects. I think there are several cases have been found even from India that uh, they got some of the people who uh, you know, smuggled uh, butterflies from India to the other countries. So this is one way of, you know, exploitation, exploiting this uh, uh, diversity, especially it is important because if something is related to the rare species, there are many insect species out there who are rare, that means their population size is low. It's, it's not low, not because of the breeding, because they are naturally low in number. And when people do over exploit or they collect it, those things or they harvest because there is a, so when we are doing that thing, that also leads to our extinction. So this is another paper came in 2020 uh, by the group of Samways. So they say, what will be the solution for that? When you are talking of the conservation of the insects, what are the solutions? So the the idea that whether we do have a protected area network or not, because to live a population, you know, it needs sourcing connection. You need some meta population structure to be existed. So if the protected area networks are not there, similarly like tigers or elephants or any other wildlife, they also need that network. Unless they have that network, there will be a lot of studies being done in Europe, especially on the butterfly group, where they found that the meta population structure actually collapsed. They also stressed that uh, database which phylogenetic groups they are, what is their uh, genetic sequence and how many different D uh, DNAs are there. So this is one of the fastest way of the DNA barcoding technology. So many of the countries starts doing that because the whole idea is the number is so much. It's a hyper diverse world and we have very less time because we don't have a data. There is very less. There's one taxa in the whole world. You can say that which is taxonomically is more or less we know is a bird species, right? Rather than that, birds and mammals, we have very less understanding about the other species as such. So this is one of the things which that is why they are stressing up that it may increase the speed of identification process and which may lead to into more data. The more data we have, the more kind of you know informed decision we can make. If we don't have a data, we cannot make any informed decision, right? So we need this kind of information. Plus, they, this paper is talking about how to map. We need the mapping of the individual species. We need the map mapping of the species, habitat type, ecosystem, biomass. If we don't have those maps with us, we, we don't know which are the areas are important for that, which are the which are acting as a corridor which are the areas we needed to be red listed where more and more species is there which which should be our which is the place we start our conservation uh you know prioritize our conservation so unless we have those kind of information this this is we are not going to conserve these insects and many insects are really good indicators of the system itself many insect, insects are one group of insects are good indicator for the other groups of insects. There is one paper which is published by David Pearson group. They saw that how tiger beetle diversity and by butterfly diversity are very interlinked. So if you know one diversity, one group of diversity, you can understand that what should be the other group of the diversity is there. And now we, we apart from the genetic technology, we have a technology which is called GIS based technology. And with GIS based technology, this is, there is a multiple proliferation of new ideas is coming up. There's a software called Maxtent, which gives us the idea of predictive habitat modeling. 
So if we get the data, presence data from the secondary sources, I'll come to that secondary sources in a while. We, if we get even not going to feel, if you get the, from the secondary sources, that data, the presence data of the animal, we can create the whole set of areas where the species may exist, which can be a very good kind of start of any conservation thing. So we, we know which are the areas. If I get an area, for example, I get a butterfly, particular butterfly, lime butterflies data for Delhi. And I know that what are the habitat factors connect that butterfly? What are the habitat requirements is that I can create that thing for the entire country. I know which are the spots this species is going to use. I know which are the probable species range boundary will be there. And then I, through this more modeling, we, we, with if we take that climate as one of the variable, in a next climate change scenario, where the which are the areas which will be used as a climatic refuge by this animal, by this a particular species. So these new technologies are giving us a huge capacity in order to get into a more right kind of conservation decision making process. And more and more people will connect, the more and more scientists are, will be using this technology. I think that that is going to change their whole idea that how important and critically we are connecting our survivability with this insect group. Apart from the scientists, the people who are not scientists, maybe there are many of them in the audience who are not scientists, what we can do if we don't want to do science, right? We don't want to do research. But yes, as an individual, what we can do? So that is also a big question, right? Especially when we are talking right now these days about the, you know, greening of the urban areas. So more and more people are getting into the urban areas, like the estimation is almost 50 to 80 percent people are moving into the urban areas, right? So the more and more people coming into that, the more and more we are thinking how we can keep those ecosystem services available to that people because we don't want people to in a bad health or in, in a bad state because they are crowding the cities. So there is a new ideas are coming up in urban forestry, recreational forestry, urban uh, the green urban planning. So all these things are coming up. And one of the things which is important is a garden. The more and more you have garden at your backyards, and we are talking about right now the vertical garden also, not horizontal garden. Even if you have a vertical garden, any kind of shape and size of the garden will help them. So it the garden will not as not only aesthetically please you, right? It can be also a kitchen garden also, right? That can that can give you some kinds of provisions, right? You can entirely have the chemical free garden, organic garden. And also it can help those birds, it can help small creatures like insects, right? And there has been multiple work being done in especially in UK regarding these uh, bees, because people are now more into bees because the, they understand how pollination is important. The very simple thing they have done is that in a wooden block, if you put a small hole, right, create the small holes, or you can create this kind of structure, right? So that is enough for for the overwintering time of the this group. And they can they can efficiently use that this even within that R1 structure, they can use that. And that may lead to increase of the population. And that may lead to stop or delaying the process of the extinction. And the last thing which I probably, this is my submission to the, all of the viewers who are seeing my presentation is, the world, I think I believe that world move, if is what we believe, what is our intention, what is our use, right? So as an individual consumer, if we stop, or if we reduce which is coming from products which is coming from the chemical based farming we may have created the market for the other end of the spectrum which is very organic where lesser amount of fertilizer pesticides and everything because it is not only for our ecosystem not only for this insect group not only for the mammals or the parts it's also impacting us and we know now we have clear evidence the first thing which has been generated by Rachel Carson's silent spring, 1970s, 
Now it's 50 years and still we are struggling on that phase. So if we, if we customize our demand, if we craft our demand, I think the supply side will change and it will change eventually. Mm -hmm. And this will create a very different world. And when it comes to uh, the citizens as a group, right now we are talking about in wildlife and other, other areas, we are talking about how as a citizens we contribute, as a collective way we can contribute, right? And most of the cases in, in it started, it's the kind of uh, a mini revolution started how is that the scientists cannot by themselves save the world. It needs the people who may not be from the science background, but their involvement is more important than the scientific involvement. And that is why the uh, program they have in California, they have a Californian uh, pollination project. In Odevans, they have uh, hummingbird projects, right? In India also, we started a lot of uh, citizen science program, but programs like in Bangalore, we have a slow lorry citizen science based program. We have citizen science based program for e-birds program, but in at uh, insect level, we didn't have right now, but uh, if National Geological uh, uh, Park and along with other institutions may push or create a drive for this, I think that will be a huge kind of thing for us because we need more data. We need more people. We need more people to see what is happening around them. Right. So if we can create that is that we, that is going to help the scientific people a lot. Or when the science will be created based on that data, that will help the policymakers a lot. So we can have some policies for that. Unless we have a policies, we probably cannot, you know, end up with something very good. Because at the end of the day, it depends on what is our collective choice rather than our individual choice. And the last thing for all the students, if you people are present here, what from my understanding, what I can say is that I know many people are you know good in photography that uh, for bird photography or the mammals photography, you need an expensive lens from 400 mm to 600 mm lens. But trust me, if you have a macro lens, <clears throat> which is very, very you know, less expensive and you roam around your, you know, backyard with that camera and the macro lens, you will find a very different set of the world, which have, you have never seen. Right. And that is so interesting. And those photographs will also help our science. So you just need a camera with you, go to your backyard, click a photo and put it into different kinds of domains which use those information. Like one of the domains is observation.org. One of the domain is iNaturalist domain. These are the public domain where you can share the information. And from that, those platform, uh, the students who are doing science, the scholars who are doing science or the scientists who are serious for the conservation, they can take out the information from that. And those information will be very, very valuable. Because without the understanding, because insect group is so huge, so broad, not one scientist, 20 scientists, 100 or 2,000 scientists will solve the problem. It needs the entire population, humanity itself. And if we not able to do that, then there's one of one of the columnists in New York Times, he said in 2018, that one of the things he said that uh, the insect apocalypse is here. Uh, what does it mean for the rest of the life now? So he quoted E.O. Wilson again, who is my favorite person, that E.O. Wilson has written of an insect-free world, a place where most plants and land animals became extinct, where fungi explodes for a while, thriving on dead and rot, where the human species survives able to fall back on wind pollinated grains and marine fishing despite mass starvation and resource wars clinging to the survival in the devastated world and trapped in eco ecological dark age he adds in that condition in that ecological age if we lose this beautiful spectrum of insects the survivors would offer prayers for the return of weeds and bugs so how humanity is really will be wanting if we lose that. And there will be, as you know, that the earth has certain capacity. We 
have only one art. We have no plan B, right? So many uh, exploration being done. We, we have no plan B till now. So if you have one plan, the plan A, then it's important that we really take care about that plan. And science is definitely going to help the conservation. But it's not about science, but it's about the people like you and me who can actually share our understanding, our belief system in order to save this world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Opumanyu. Uh, I'm sure कि हमारे जो साथ में जुड़े हुए हैं कुछ ना कुछ क्वेश्चन होंगे पहला मेरा क्वेश्चन था आपसे yeah. कि जैसा आपने सिटीजन साइंस के बारे में बताया हाँ. हमने अपने जूम में एक जूम मेनिया करके एक सिटीजन साइंस प्रोग्राम शुरू किया ओके ओके शुरू में थोड़ी सी हमें इंटरेस्टिंग एंट्रीज आई ओके लेकिन अभी फिलहाल uh, उसके बाद थोड़ा सा धीमा पड़ गया ये ओके okay. तो आ, इसको बूस्ट करने का कोई आ, हम क्या छोटी कोई ऐसी वर्कशॉप कर सकते हैं हमारे जो विस्टर्स आते हैं या कुछ कोई ऐसा आइडिया आप अगर सजेस्ट करना चाहें जिससे कि हम आ, लोगों का इंटरेस्ट ऑफ कोर्स जू में आते हैं लोग तो वो उन्हीं को देखने आते हैं जो हमने जो यहाँ डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ इंसेक्ट्स हैं बटरफ्लाईज हैं बर्ड्स हैं तो उसके लिए हमने ये एक प्रोग्राम शुरू किया था तो शुरू में इनिशियली हमें एंट्री आई इवन मैंने तो मैं तो सही बताऊं कि मैंने जो भी फोटोग्राफर्स दिखते थे मैं उनको रोक रोक के बोलता था कि सर आप कुछ भेजिए अगर आपको कुछ नई चीज दिखती है तो दैट विल ऐड इन आवर बायोडाइवर्सिटी हम उसकी लिस्टिंग करेंगे तो कुछ अगर आप ऐसा कुछ सजेशन आपके पास हो तो हम दो चीज है इसमें एक तो एक हमारा जो लेवल है यूनिवर्सिटी लेवल बिकॉज आई एम फ्रॉम अकेडमी सो आई कैन से फ्रॉम द अकेडमिक लेवल इट तो एक तो जो हमारा यूनिवर्सिटी है इट्स ऑलमोस्ट अराउंड वी हैव थर्टी थाउजेंड स्टूडेंट्स इन आवर कैंपस सो थर्टी थाउजेंड इज अज नंबर सो मे बी आउट ऑफ थर्टी थाउजेंड इवन टेन परसेंट इज क्वाइट ह्यूज यू कैन अंडरस्टैंड दैट यस 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 तो अगर हम तीन हजार लोगों में भी पहुंचा रहा है स्टूडेंट में पहुंचा रहा है तो आई होप जो तीन हजार से नौ हजार होंगे नौ हजार से अठारह हजार होंगे सो दैट विल गो फ्रॉम माउथ टू माउथ लाइक दैट बिकॉज दिस डेज uh connecting things right. are very easy because of the social media thing, right platform second important thing is that aap uh, log ek social media campaign kar sakte ho iske upar and we will try to help you out in that campaign definitely as an academic institution hum aapko help karenge ji third cheez ye hai ki i uh, till now i have not done any citizen science project but right now one of my students is working on uh all the citizen science project in india so she will be looking for ki citizen science ka success points kya hai aur failure point kya hai there are certain citizen science programs usme success hai and there are certain citizen science programs usme partial or failure right partial success and failure so she is doing that whole mapping of thing for her dissertation work so once we able to you know map the whole thing probably i can be more specific to give you the points that which are the points you able to do that so hard work will be done i think by may this month uh, this year so okay. by may this year probably i can give you that okay these are the five pointers where you can start to work with and which leads okay. to the success of the program okay okay okay, okay. thank you mansi aap kuch koi question karna chahenge question when we were talking about the uh, use of uh, science and technology and you mentioned um, monitoring and uh, gis uh, gis max and then uh, these uh, technology and uh, devices which can be used for uh, conservation but like on the other hand we see in popular media there are uh, certain uh, devices like robo pollinators which is like very famous and people are getting funding and they are working on it and things like that so like uh, is it feasible to spend the money on uh, these uh, pollinators which are kind of plan b once the insect go go in uh, extinct and then we we are supposed to use them or we should use all that to uh, you know in other uh, conservation programs and campaigns to maintain our diversity which we have right now so instead of uh, planning what will happen after these will go extinct uh, 
is it isn't it better to use uh, all that to conserve what we already have my answer can be prejudiced to my belief system but yeah still it's a nice question no doubt like for example we we uh, since you know last 200 years we created so many things of our own and we think that now those things can be solution to us including the green revolution but we can right now see what is happening with the green revolution even when it comes to the geo engineering thing right creating artificial rain or interlinking of the rivers and also you get to see what what is the end because nature's design is so complex that human design probably till now till now i am not saying it, it human cannot able to do that but till now our understanding of the nature is not very comprehensive we don't know the complexity plus it's not about the pollination insects is not about the pollination i can give you almost i think um, 20 to 28 different kind of services given by insects so pollination is one of them we have medicine engineering monitoring genetic resources ornaments biocontrol disease control invasive invasion resistance plant dispersal water flow oxygen production 28 different kinds of services are there so pollination we may think that okay instead of bee we can start artificial pollination yeah maybe in some areas where you 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 wanted to restore back the environment where the bees is already extinct you can do that start doing that but i don't think that is a good kind of you know solution for the natural element because if you look our earth history this is this happened for billions of years it's not one day things happen right so if we wanted to you know address the problems which is coming through so many years uh, in one day or one year we are going to solve that problem it's not possible so i think rather than spending on that there is more uh, uh, there should be more spending on creating more green spaces right kind of green spaces because we can spend a lot of money but that is not going to you know increase our survivability as a human being right because we still don't know i guess more than 60 70% of the species in 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 this planet but we spend a lot of money going to the mars and other planet in order to find the life we don't know the life here what is around us and what is their function and how we are intricately depend on that right so that is important we need to know at least what is around us right so rather than spending money on things like that i don't think it's my personal opinion is rather than spending money on that we can spend more money on creating a better kind of you know green atmosphere around us Thank you, uh, Dr. Upmanyu. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, our joint director, uh, Miss uh, Anamika, ma'am, to uh, give vote of thanks to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Upamanyu Upa for sparing valuable time from his uh, busy uh, schedule. And uh, it was a wonderful talk on the role of insects in, ecosys in ecosystem conservation and how we humans can contribute in this uh, conservation. And as rightly pointed by him, that we need not to be scientists to... Uh, preserve or protect our ecosystem we our small efforts can uh, bring uh, major changes so uh, uh, what we can do at, at our level to save this environment to save this ecosystem uh, was uh, clearly uh, uh, mentioned by uh, doc sahab so uh, uh, on behalf of nzp and director nzp i extend a sincere thanks to uh, Dr. Upamanyu for delivering this wonderful talk and it was quite an insightful uh, lecture and we look forward to more such talks in future also. So thank you, Dr. Thank, thank you. Sir. Thank, thank you, you. ma'am. Thank you. 
थैंक यू डॉक्टर थैंक यू डॉक्टर उपमन्यून थैंक यू सर थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच